G'day ZGD here and welcome to Pillars of Eternity. In this video I'm going to be showing off and going through a detailed look at the character creation system in the game and giving some tips from things that I've learned about the game so far in my review testing of the game. So let's jump straight into it and I'll walk you guys through the process and give you guys a bit of a, a bit of a look at some of the different classes and things like that you can expect to see in the game. Now the first option you are given is of course whether you want to be male or female. Now male or female uh, it doesn't, doesn't restrict you in too many ways but it will have some small impacts on how your character role plays out in certain scenarios. Like certain people are going to respond to you differently whether you're male or female. You know that's that's the world. Some people might be attracted to you if they're if you're of a certain gender if they have that certain preference. So it can have some minor impacts but overall this is just going to be mostly a role playing option for you. You can play the gender that you want to play in this world. So let's continue on just here. Next up we move into the much more important uh, decision of race. Now race will again impact some of the ways that people interact with you, some of the interactions you have in the world, and some of the kind of like smaller things that you encounter just like with uh, just like with your gender. But race has some much more important impacts on your starting stats. Now it's a big aesthetic choice obviously, the difference in the looks between each of the different races is pretty pretty notable. You can further customize each of these though, so uh, you, when you see these different races here, like just because you're like, oh, I don't really like the look of the godlike, but I'm interested in you know what this class offers, dexterity and intellect, don't be afraid because you can actually uh, customize through sub races and then actual appearance customization down here on the right hand side you can see just there. So for example, the godlike race is kind of a mysterious race of uh, a mixed, you know, they, they're actually uh, born this way uh, from different races, so there's different types of godlikes first. You can see the death godlike, there's the fire godlike, the moon godlike, and the nature godlike. But then if you choose one of these guys, you can actually move on in and say, all right, which type of godlike are you? You know, maybe I was a godlike who, of the elf sort of beginnings, or maybe I was an all in, or maybe I was, you know, or maybe I was human. So there's a, you can choose the different races there. So there is sort of further customization as you move through each of those. So if we go back in here, you'll see that if we move into something like Orland, for example, you, there's different types of you know sub races within this as well. So we have the Hearth Orland and we have the Wild Orland. Now the important thing for these uh, sub sort of decisions here. So if we if we go back and look at the Godlikes here, uh, they have different uh, sub effects essentially based on their sub race. So you have the overall uh, race effect of Dexterity and Intellect for Godlike, and then if you move down into the sub races, Death God like for example has the death's usher passive when the death godlike attack an enemy with 15% or less endurance so an enemy that's almost dead their damage is increased so basically this the death godlike is uh, especially proficient at bringing death to their enemies and then as you move through each of these you can see there's different there's different changes between each of those for example the moon godlike is a little bit more healing oriented when every encounter when reduced below 75 50 and 25 percent endurance so as the moon godlike takes damage uh they they give out healing uh waves towards you know themselves and their enemies so they can heal the endurance of their party so they can play more of a bit, bit more of a support role so you can strongly theme your character and uh pick these things sort of to align yourself to a specific class as well like if you want to have a specific role in combat so for example if you were playing a bit more of a support character or maybe if you were you know if you were up the front maybe like a paladin or something taking damage and defending your party from harm and as you took that damage you could have the silver tide effect from the moon godlike taking effect in healing your party so I'll just go back through the various races here as you can see human there uh human have strong strong resolve and might now these plus ones uh, as you'll see in the attributes uh, a little bit later, only a minor difference. They're, they're not a huge difference, but if you if you're the type to try and min max, then you're going to want to pick the appropriate race for the class you're going for. And we can go through that once we get up to classes. So an important thing to note is that the sub races don't always have big differences. Sometimes they're more of a thematic choice. The human is a good example of this. Underneath the meadow folk, we have fighting spirit once per encounter, five seconds after being reduced below 50% endurance. Folk temporarily gain bonuses to accuracy and damage. Now all of these are tagged as folk. This is a an attribute of humans in general this is something all humans share in common and the differences between sub races of humans are much you know much less varied than of other races so the ocean folk are the same as are the savannah folk so it's mostly an aesthetic and theme based choice and you can read about the aesthetics and the theme through each of those just there now just to sort of compare for some of you guys we can go through the Amaua, and i'm probably pronouncing that slightly wrong but uh, inside of Coastal, we have Towering Physique. Coastal Amaua gain bonus to, bonuses to defend against prone and stun effect, whereas the island 
island variant, the, the island sub-race, uh, come un armed to the teeth, so they gain an additional weapon set that they can switch between. And then if we go back through dwarves here, we have the mountain dwarf, which are hale and hardy mountain dwarves, have a bonus to defend against poison and disease attacks. The boreal have hunter's instincts, the boreal grain gains 15 accuracy against any creature of the wild or of primordial type, so they make kind of uh, better hunters. And then under elves, we have wood elves, with the dis distance advantage in against any enemy that's more, fi more than 4 meters away, Wood Elves gain bonuses to accuracy, deflection, and reflexes. Obviously a fine choice if you want to play a ranger. And then under Pale Elf we have Elemental Endurance. All Pale Elves have increased burn and freeze damage reductions. So if you want to go for that theme and get those sort of bonuses uh, aligned with that, that can work pretty well too. Going into all on the final one just here to show for you guys. The Hearth all on has the minor threat trait. When attacking any target that is also being targeted by a teammate, Hearth all ons convert some of the hits into crits, so they potentially make pretty nice rogues. And the Wild all on which instead has Defiant to Resolve. After being subjected to a will attack, Wild all ons temporarily gain a bonus to all defenses. So you have quite a bit of customization just in the race choices alone. As you can see, each of those gives those different stats. Some do have penalties, for example, the all on being particularly small, uh, have less might than other races, so that might be something you have to deal with, and something you have to keep in mind if you're planning on going something like a fight or a row. You're gonna have, you're not gonna be quite as strong as others. But this is, of course, something you can build around in attributes. I mean, an all on can overcome their race disadvantage by training a lot and becoming particularly strong, or maybe some are just born strong. So now we can move on to class choices. Now an important thing to know about classes in Pillars of Eternity is they are not race or gender locked, so you can play the gender or the race you like to be have the most fulfilling role-playing experience that you want and to min-max your stacks as much as you want if that's what you're into then you can choose any class that suits your fancy and of course if you want to play something that makes no sense so if you want to play an all-end barbarian or something for example then uh, if that's if that is your jam then you can do so and there's no restrictions on doing that other than you know the minor stat penalties that you might face or the lack of sy synergy but that for some people makes a much more interesting playthrough so classes have a number of important effects on the way your character plays and their stats now the first thing is the starting ability not all classes have a specific starting ability but instead it can be uh, defined by unique mechanics associated with that class but an example of a class that does have a specific starting ability is the Barbarian, which has Carnage, which uh, essentially applies a bit of an AoE to their regular attacks, so uh, whenever they swing their weapons, they swing with enough ferocity to uh, damage every all the enemies around them. Now, us, on the other hand, we have, for example, the Cypher, which is a bit more of a, a, a bit of a unique style of class, and rather than having a built-in power instead, this class has some unique mechanics associated with it. The Cypher in particular uh, builds up focus and then uses that focus, its unique resource, to use its Cypher powers, which are, you know, selected separately after you select the class. Now the second effect that choosing your class has on your character is uh, some bonus skills essentially. So the Barbarian has Athletics and Survival. A nice thing about the um, character creation tool by the way is that when you're sort of looking your way through this and trying to decide what you want to make, you can actually mouse over any of this red text here and there'll be a pop-up showing specifically or giving some more information on what that thing is exactly. So the Barbarian has Athletics and Survival, the Cypher has Stealth, Lore and Mechanics and these all play into the theme of the character. So we can see Athletics, Lore and Survival here. If I go something to like the rogue for example we have stealth and mechanics which mechanics is essentially like lock picking uh we have you know on the priest we have athletics and law so there's a mixture of these different bonus skills that uh, usually have some sort of synergy or theming towards that class now the final thing to note is the uh the grouping of sort of defensive abilities just here so there is Endurance and Health. Endurance and Health are your measure of your character's life, essentially. They're a measure of a character's vitality. Endurance is in combat, and Health is your overall. So you have essentially two health pools. Endurance is your measure of essentially when you'll be knocked out in combat, how much pain your character can take in combat before they bec become unconscious. And then Health is your overall sort of long-term uh, life. That's much harder to recover and can only be recovered through rest, while Endurance can be healed through healing. And uh, the Endurance and Health change based on uh, the maths essentially for that change is based on the class so different classes will be inherently uh, tankier than other classes now on the same token accuracy and deflection changes as well the monk is a particularly balanced class that's why i've selected this one just for this because uh it has a pretty sort of a balanced approach to all of the different defensive mechanics whereas something like a ranger might have 
uh, a little bit less in endurance, but maybe have higher uh, higher deflection. Now, accuracy is the other mechanic in here as well, and that's a measure of your characters to hit. So all of these change depending on your class. You don't really need to, I think, worry about this too much if this is your first playthrough. This is more of a uh, sort of in informative thing if you're looking to min-max your character, but it can give you a bit of a measure of, you know, is a class tanky or not tanky, though usually the theme of the class is pretty obvious even without looking at these stats. Now, the next step is once you've chosen your class, when you hit the next button here, you actually get to choose some abilities. Now, the rogue has two abilities just here, and you get a choice of essentially one of these abilities. So if I select unselect one there, you'll see remaining one. So the rogue has two starting abilities potentially that it can choose, and you can choose to start with one. So you want to blind enemies or cripple enemies. Now, depending on the class you pick, you get a number of different options. The cypher, which is kind of a spellcastery style character, unique sort of spellcaster, instead has a choice of a larger amount of abilities, but gets to pick two class. So you can look through each of these and decide the one you want, and you can unselect and then choose the specific abilities you want to you want to go with. Something like the barbarian, again, only choose only a choice of one, but if we go to something like a wizard, which a wizard's power is in its, you know, is in its versatility of spellcasting, we see a much larger list of potential spells, and then a much larger sort of option, you know, like a wizard is a more physically frail character, but knowledge is their power, so knowing a lot of skills or knowing a lot of spells is essential to be able to, uh, you know, be useful in the game. Now another interesting exception to kind of the, the rules for this is like, and just showing again how Pills of Eternity makes uh, class selection a really interesting and engaging thing is, rather than su choosing a skill for the priest, you instead choose a deity. So this gets to uh, give a big theming sort of effect to your character, but it also affects how you have to play your character as well, because if you do a bunch of things that falls out of line with your deity, something that your deity would disapprove of, then that can cause uh, repercussions in the game. Another fun one to look at is the druid, which instead of choosing uh, abilities, gets to choose which sort of shapeshift they can do, so which sort of animal they are able to shapeshift into. Okay, so the next thing is attributes, and you guys are probably used to this if you've played a lot of CRPGs in the past. Now the first thing to note is that you'll notice the stars next to the uh, attributes just there. Those are the recommended attributes for your character. So if I click sort of for mouse over resolve just here, I'm playing as a fighter. Resolve is highly recommended for fighting. You can see it on the right hand side there. And then perception is recommended. Now the reason for this is, this is this might seem a little bit unusual because this is a little bit different to what you see often in other uh, RPGs where you might see something like perception being more for a ranger, you're right? So for the, so picking out things, it's usually associated with eyesight. Well, in this particular case, uh, this is for doing things like blocking and evading enemies and essentially being having your eyes open and being aware of what's happening in combat. So perception, that's why that's ranked as recommended for fighter. So an important thing to know is that 10 is the baseline for all stats. Now you'll notice I, I, I obtained some bonuses through my class and race selection. Now you can actually subtract points if you want and then you'll start to see the negative effects here. So I, I lose area of effect, um, duration and minus will, which will is used uh, for uh, sort of opposing mental things. So if someone tries to cast uh, a mind-based magic on you to confuse or charm you, for example, then will is what you use to resist that. So you can see the negative effects as you start to reduce these. Now, being able to reduce this is important though, because you may want to uh, be a little bit less skilled in a certain area that's less important to your class, but put these points into another area that is more important for your class. Now, if you just leave it with what you start with, then you can't really put as much into the points you want to go for. Now, a good way to sort of learn what each of these attributes does is to actually simply play around with them. So anything below 10 is going to be a negative penalty, right? So if we move down, if we become less mighty, then we lose damage and healing and we also lose fortitude. So if you put points in then you can see how each point it jumps up as we move up just there. So might deals with damage and healing and fortitude. As you can see just here, fortitude is for resisting things like poison and disease. It's sort of anything that happens internally to your body, usually natural based things. Uh, now, Might is also used for some extra checks. Pretty much all of these attributes can be used for extra che uh, checks, especially like role-playing or random encounters or anything like that. It's like, you know, a log falls on one of your party members. Might will help you lift it off 
The next one we have is Constitution, which deals with endurance, health, and fortitude. Now, this is not always starred on characters, so on the fighter it's starred, but you might be playing another character that still Constitution is important for, but it might not be recommended. And it's usually, I think, recommended for me personally, I'm recommending for you guys to uh, consider putting some points into Constitution, even if it's not one of your recommended stats, because this deals with both your endurance and your health, and uh, these are both very important for it you know, any sort of combat-based character, which is every character is going to experience combat at some point, and being able to take more damage is going to mean less mishaps, and if you're playing on one of the harder difficulties, then you're obviously going to want to have a little bit more constitution to give you a bit more room for error, potentially. Next up, we have Dexterity. Now, this one is... Uh, in this one can be beneficial for everyone, usually in RPGs, dexterity is only really beneficial for things like rogues or rangers, and it's going to be more beneficial for that, uh, those sorts of classes in this game, of course. But it also increases action speed. Now, every character is affected by this, including spellcasters. Action speed is the rate at which you can do things in combat, and that includes casting spells. So, dexterity is still important, it sort of reduces the, the time it takes to do these things. So, having a dexterous character in general is going to make you a little bit speedier in combat, which means you can get a little bit more done in a shorter amount of time. Perception in Pillars of Eternity is a little bit different to how it often is in RPGs, and it's primarily a defensive stat in Pillars of Eternity, actually. It deals with interrupt, deflection, and reflexes. Intellect is your classic spellcaster one. It's mostly used for spellcasters. I mean, will is useful for everybody, but if you're a fighter, you can potentially stand to have a little bit less will. Though if you're a party leader, you probably don't want to be moving into the penalties, but that's up to you. If you are a spellcaster, though, pumping your intellect as much as possible is going to be very helpful because it increases the area of effect of all of your skills and the duration of them as well. Now, a nice thing to know is that if you are a fighter and you're not having much intellect, now you can kind of make up the gap with a little bit of resolve. You can see here that the fighter is has highly recommended Resolve, and you'll see that Resolve also gives Will too, so we can see Intellect gives Will and Resolve gives Will. Now, I've got a minus two penalty to two Will just here, but if I start putting points into Resolve, I can start to get a bunch of extra Will, so that's going to help me out in contact. So even though I'm not particularly smart, and that sort of makes it a bit harder to deal with some particular things like maybe uh, an illusion has been cast, uh, my Resolve can help see me through those things that I can't quite figure out. Resolve is pretty useful for everyone. It, uh, it deals with how likely you are to be interrupted, and it also deals with how likely you are to deflect attacks as well. Now, Resolve is going to be particularly nice for any sort of party leader or someone who's going to be in the thick of things or doing very important tasks. If you have a very important character who you can't afford to have interrupted, then having high Resolve can be very, very helpful. Now, the next selection after you've selected your attributes is your culture. Now, culture has uh, a bit of an impact on your starting themed gear. Not a major one, but it's kind of cool to see how the armor changes as you move through each of the different cultures just there. Now, you can pick based on that, but I suggest picking based on the stats. Of course, if you're going for a roleplay heavy playthrough, then you may want to pick something that uh, appeals to you based on the lore of your character and the background of your character, something that better suits you. Now, it also does give a slight stat bonus there. As you can see, perception, might, constitution, intellect, resolve, dexterity and resolve there as well. Now this can, if we find the one that gives might, this can take you above the 19 limit that you can get from the attribute allocation usually. So we've got up to 20 might just there on our fighter because we have lived a pretty hardy life in the living lands. After we've selected our culture, we get to select our background. So that is kind of like how a character was raised, the life they've led up to this point. And this also gives you a bonus, but this is to skills instead of attributes. So rather than, you know, your your birth right stat modifications, we have, you know, what how your life has shaped you. So uh, as a colonist, you have particularly good survival skills. As a mercenary, you have good athletics and law. You have a good understanding of the lands. As a scientist, you have good law and mechanics. As a merchant, you have good law and mechanics as well. Athletics and mechanics, you get to choose this as a very thin based thing as well, uh, but it also is sort of a nice way of helping you max out some of the skills that are going to be more useful. So if you maybe want to go into a bit more of a stealthy role, then having a having, having led a life of a hunter is going to probably going to be pretty be beneficial to that job in particular. Now finally we get to modify it. <clears throat> Now that's everything that has an in-game effect on your character. Everything beyond this point is just personalization for you. Now you get to uh, change the colors. Now you get to change skin color. You have a couple of choices just here. And hair color, a little bit of a wider choice. Some, some brighter colors and some more natural tones. And then we also get primary and secondary of the clothing. Now this can be changed at any time inside of the game as well. So if you add a character to your party or if you decide you want to change your look a little bit, then you can do so. It's a good idea to uh, potentially to make it party management a bit easier to see what's going 
going on in combat, have your characters have distinct colours, especially if they are all of the similar race. Because we can do things like, my red armoured hero just there is, you know, I know who that is, that's my fighter. So if you want to use that to help you spot those characters and help you manage things a little, little bit better than you can do so. There are a bunch of different head choices here which kind of modifies the face. Uh, these choices are all different depending on your race as well. After the human I'll show you something that's a little bit different. And then we also have hair choices just there as well so we can change our hair through a number of different choices. I'll quickly scan through those for you guys. Quite a few different choices, obviously male and female have different hair options and different faces, but if we go back to race now, and I'm going to go to the godlike race just here, we'll choose we'll choose the fire godlike for you guys. Now I can probably go back to appearance, and as you can see we don't have the option for facial hair or hair, but we do have the option for head changes, so we can change how the character looks pretty dramatically in that regard. Now there's a little bit less customization available just here, since these characters are very distinctive to begin with, but you do get to sort of change these things. So that depends on your race, exactly what you can change in terms of your appearance. Now after that you get to choose your portrait, so you probably want to choose something that matches with you, but it's up to you, you've got a bunch of different choices, there are male and female, and uh, you can mix and match for some reason if you want to. If you want to play a female that looks with the portrait like this for some reason, then you have that option. I don't really understand. But we can move in finally to the final selection, and voice. Now, we have a bunch of different voices, both in male and female. Hmm. Leading the way. They won't see me coming. Hmm? I shall lead us. So you can choose something that appeals to you or that you feel suits your character, or if you want you to have a silent main protagonist, and I really like this option of the game, you can choose none. And then you can do your own character's voice work when you talk at the computer as you're playing. So guys, that is it for Pillars of Eternity's character creation. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this look at it, and hopefully you learned a few things that will help make your adventures a little bit more enjoyable. Anyway guys, make sure to stick around because I'm going to have a whole bunch of content coming on Pillars of Eternity on my YouTube channel. So that's it for now, I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.